Talking Sexy Radio Network, playing the sexiest music on the planet. I think my eardrums just connected. It's time for Stages of Life Radio with Dr. David Klein. Have a medical question? Call 407-422-1212. That's 407-422-1212. Or text 23680. Well, isn't that a treat? Stages of Life Medical Institute bringing you Stages of Life radio show live right now. Give us a call, 407-422-1212. I am Melissa Fox and Dr. Klein, David Klein from Stages of Life Medical Institute is on board to take your questions. And Well, today we're going to talk about a lot of different things. It's not just going to be about... Uh, Stages of Life Medical Institute, we got to talk about insulin resistance and pre-diabetes, and y'all better listen up. <laughs> hey, or you're, or you're going to start believing the commercials that are on the air. Right, don't believe the commercials. Well, uh, believe Dave's Believe our commercials. Yeah. <laughs> Stages commercials. Yeah. Anyway, and here we go. Let's All right. <laughs> so in any event, so what I wanted to do today, you know, was to try to address an issue that is actually quite common. You know, it's a significant number, maybe a third of the people, 40% of the people listening right now have this issue, most of whom don't even know they've got it. And it's called insulin resistance syndrome. Now, why am I talking about it? Because I was watching the news and on went this ridiculous commercial, you know, offering up a, a bizarre product to treat, wouldn't you know it, insulin resistance, you know. So what is insulin resistance and why do you care? And the answer is very simple. It's because it is a leading chronic illness in this country that results in things like obesity, it results in dementia, it results in arthritis, it results in just about every chronic disease you can possibly have. So why is this not something that you may have discussed, discovered, or even uh, enjoyed the possibility of up until this point? And the answer is very simple. It's because it's diagnosed so easily with a single $15, $20, $30 lab test that you would be shocked. You'd be absolutely amazed at how easy it is to sort through this thing and know exactly what's going on with your physiology. Why it isn't done more routinely, I can only imagine that the, you know, the, the different types of excuses we hear, the most f uh, famous one, the most common one, the typical one that I get from doctors is, I've learned enough already. Or, there's another good one, which is, well, they didn't teach me that in medical school. That is my favorite one, okay? Because they really don't teach you in medical school what you need to know. What they do is teach you how to learn. They teach you how to find things at a library. That's what medical school is all about. Learning the vocabulary, learning how to wear the white coat, learning a little bit of attitude, and learning how not to puke in the, you know, when you see blood. That's really what you know, medical school is all about. So I didn't learn about that. Therefore, it's not to be learned. So why do you care about this? The answer is very simple. In, in this day and age, with $10,000 insurance deductibles, you'd better take care of yourself. Because the likelihood of you actually getting your insurance carrier to pay for anything is pretty small. They will pay for inexpensive, I mean, and I do mean inexpensive generic medications, things that many of the pharmacies and drugstores give away for free. They'll pay for those. Anything that's new and improved, anything that may be still under patent, has a, has, and, you know, has a brand name attached to it, you have to go through all kinds of gyrations before they'll approve it. And then when they do, you're paying for uh, an incredibly large percentage of what this thing costs. So insurance is actually a sucker's bet. Why do you do it at all? And the answer is so that you don't end up with financial ruin if you have a catastrophic illness. It's the same reason why you get automobile insurance. If you bought automobile insurance that paid for every oil change that you had, for every tank of gasoline, and for every wiper change, you would be paying a fortune. So what do you do? You go ahead and you make a decision, an economic decision. How much can I afford to pay if somebody hits me? That's called your deductible. Then what happens? You start making other decisions like, well, do I want to have uh, rental car insurance? Do I want to have un underinsured, uninsured, da, 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 all this other type of insurance? And you have to make a decision, an economic one. Am I willing to give up money in my pocket to protect me from financial ruin? So folks that are successful have a tendency to figure this out pretty well. Folks that are not would rather buy a bass boat or they would rather go do a weekend at the beach or whatever and then find themselves with, unable to pay for their kids' college education because they weren't clever about how they saved or spent their money. The same thing is true in medicine. You find yourself um, 
looking for ways to make yourself better, keep yourself healthy. And so people are out there all the time, do it yourself again. The DIY approach to medicine is I'm gonna go to the health food store and talk to some zit-faced kid and ask him what I should be taking. Then you get the product of the week. Not the way it should be done. Certainly not the way I would I would do it. And certainly not the way that, that a, a, let's say, a, a scientific approach to this would go with it. You look for reproducibility and you look for consistency. So what is insulin resistance? So insulin resistance is not a weird concept. It is a disease state whereby the insulin receptor becomes dysfunctional, requiring your pancreas, which is where the insulin comes from, more and more and more of it to maintain a normal blood sugar. And then the blood sugar starts to creep upwards and it creeps upwards and it creeps upwards until one day you end up either peeing sugar in your urine, which used to be the way we'd pick up diabetes. Diabetes means sweet urine, all right? So we used to pick it up that way or you pick it up on routine blood work, which might be done every two or three years to the average young adult. So by that point, you're done. What are they looking for? They're looking for an A1C because that was the most recent quote unquote, you know, advance in, in diabetic diagnosis. But in fact, that's untrue largely it's a misleading so what do you want to do what you want to do is you want to catch diabetes early you want to get it before it becomes a problem for you before your eyesight starts to go before your kidneys take a hit before your brain starts to fry because of the extra blood sugar that's in your, in your body so how do you do this now I'm not the only person out there that can do this your family doc can do this your internist can do it your endocrinologist could do it if they listened and the answer is this is that you do something called an insulin to glucose ratio. Now you get the insulin, you, you get the blood sugar anyway. It's a $15 test, a BMP, it's a metabolic profile. $15 is all that costs and you get all kinds of electrolytes in there along with it. And then you get an insulin for $20, $30 or less. We do it for 15, you may have to pay more if you go someplace else. And so then you look at the ratio, the numbers, the difference, the amount of insulin that it takes to get your blood sugar into a proper range and then you know whether or not you are on the road to ruin. And if you do, it is a whole lot easier to fix it early in the game rather than waiting until you gain weight, start looking like a porker, and then come to me and go, I don't know what's wrong. So what is it about? If you find yourself gaining four or five pounds per year from the age, you know, start at 18, now you're 28 and you've got 40 extra pounds on board. So I was corrected by my wife earlier this week that that doesn't necessarily translate into three dress sizes because it might be shirt sizes and whatever, but you find <laughs> yourself okay, with You're a right. belt size that goes up. This is consistent. All of a sudden, that 24-inch waist turns into a 32-inch waist, which then turns into a 40-inch waist. An apple butt. And you start looking differently than you did when you were in high school. Mm -hmm. That's what insulin resistance is about, and that's what we're going to talk about cool. in increasingly nauseating detail after these announcements. Yeah, we're going to answer a text or two oh, first. Good. 23680. Uh, we got a couple of questions here that are not on the uh, pre diabetes or insulin resistance. Which topics. is fine. I can, I, I'm, I'm very flexible. Watch this. If you're on, on no, Facebook, no, no, I'm flexible. No, no, no don't do that. I'm not, there's no way <laughs> I am taking your foot out of there. Okay, so uh, anyway, do you see the top? top you okay, see? number one. Okay, it says, what blood test do I do? And this is Dr. Klein, not, not, not uh, Jones down the street, for thyroid disease. And the answer is very simple. I do a T3, T4. Okay, you're looking at the absolute amount of uh, triiodothyronine and uh, tetraiodothyronine in the bloodstream. Your body kicks out T4, converts it to T3. I'll look for free T3 and free T4. That tells me how much is floating around that's actually available to the cells, perhaps. We do a TPA, antithyroglobulin. These are two antibody studies looking for Hashimoto's and other autoimmune diseases of the thyroid. And then, last but not least, thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH. So you can evaluate the pituitary's interpretation of what's going on, and you can see what is actually being produced. If somebody comes out with a, with a high TPA or ATG, I'll do an ultrasound, and then we figure out what is there and what is wrong. See, there you go. Good. Easy question. Got that text in. 23680 if you have a question for Dr. David Klein. Stagesoflifemedicalinstitute.com. There are so many things on the splash page, including information on how you can become a new patient and utilize the patient portal as well. 407-422-1212 is the line to get a call 
into Doc for the show, which is Stages of Life Radio. And we will be right back. It's News Radio WFLA, Orlando. Yay, we made it. Okay. Always uh, good. Yeah, it is always good. This thing was for advancement when we charge for consults. Blood work. I'll do it. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. How are you doing there on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Periscope, Twitch, and of course, uh, on YouTube. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> there, we <laughs> yeah. there we go. I, got, I think I got them all in there. Anyway, uh, any questions for the doc, go ahead and type them in. We'll try to answer them during the commercial break, which is uh, about two and a half minutes because uh, that's how we do. Okay, so anyway, tell us a little more about insulin resistance. Yeah, okay, so you know, this is what we're discussing on the air, and we're going to come back and circle back to this. But again, insulin resistance is usually what is responsible for people gaining weight through their uh, early adulthood through their midlife, not b- really up in, until becoming seniors. So you'll gain three to five, six pounds or more, more per year, and it actually tends to accelerate as you get older and start weighing more because insulin has two functions two really important functions one is it re, you know brings blood sugar down until it no longer works and then it does something which always works that's to lay fat down onto your mid uh, midsection so why is that important because people start getting rounder and rounder and they can't figure out why they'll spend thousands of dollars on liposuction they'll spend thousands and thousands of dollars on other surgical procedures all manners of, of garbage snake oil only to find out that the real issue is insulin resistance, which is treated, you know, nutraceutically in a, in a very predictable, fairly easy way, but also medicinally. If you pick your diabetes medicines properly, even if you don't have diabetes, actually, you can bring this under control. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about the use of metformin. We'll talk about the use of chromium, vanadium. We're going to talk about the use of inositol, berberine. There are a whole bunch of ways that you can bring the blood sugar and insulin down, reversing the weight gain, and then hopefully avoiding things that you really don't like, perhaps Alzheimer's or other dementia, and cancer. And you're going to think that I'm crazy about the cancer business, but I'm not. Elevations in insulin are uh, they're inflammatory. They make all inflammatory diseases worse. Cancer is thought to be induced by chronic inflammation. So if you get the insulin under control, you reduce your risk. Statistically proven, okay, not once, but thousands of times to reduce your risk of cancer. Yeah. <laughs> so if you don't believe it, go in the National Library of Medicine, look up metformin and cancer prevention, and tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> Okay. Anyone ask if you what happened here? My dog stepped on me. Prints and everything. If you look closer, it's a bite, actually. No, it's not. Yeah. Their teeth, are, their teeth marks there. I can see it. Little prints. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly a dog paw print. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> hey. Always something. Hey, welcome back to Stages of Life Radio Sunday afternoons without fail, live at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Hope you're listening to us on either the internet at iHeartRadio. Just uh, go ahead and search for News Radio WFLA Orlando. Or maybe you're in the north of Orlando. You're listening on 94.1 FM, South Orlando 93.1 FM, and all over the peninsula at 540 AM. I am Melissa Fox, and Dr. David Klein is ready to take your calls at 407 422 1212 or the text line if you uh if you do text us at 23680 please include a little bit of information along with your question in case you know it might be Just necessary it, it, things Just, like age yeah age yeah, uh, i'm a 62 year old gender yeah, yeah. Gender, gender's important that works yeah we we got a couple more oh, oh here we go here's there's one right there you want to re- go ahead and read that or you want me to pitch it to you i'll Doug? take it I, i'll take it i'll take this one on the chin so in any <laughs> event so we've got here somebody that, that and texting in is just fine by the way while we do like hearing your voice, it's a whole lot easier to read a text. Yeah. So what do you recommend for a 63-year-old healthy woman? See, we got the age and gender. Nice. Experiencing hair shedding, sometimes known as hair loss or alopecia. Normal labs, at least the ones that they checked. Mm. This is going to be, this will be well. very important here. She's receiving an estrogen patch at 0.5 milligrams per day, which is like, it's like kissing your cousin. And oddly enough, 100 milligrams of progesterone, and I assume it's orally per day. 
this is this is a mistake. This okay. is the problem. Are this you, is the are problem. These numbers, right? First of all, uh, well, zero point. It's a, it's yeah. So it's a half okay. a milligram of estrogen per day. So yeah. she got it. The decimal's in the wrong place, but it's okay. I do okay. know. All right. So here's what the real issue is here. The patch is estradiol, which is just fine. That's the estrogen that you're going to want. Is the dosage adequate? Most of my patients, okay, you know, and we do serial, sequential estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone levels. These are blood levels, not this, the dumb saliva stuff that's out there. Or the, gee, put a, put, a, put a drop of blood on this card and send it in, and then we're going to tell you your fortune. No, th these are real blood work. You can do it, uh, you can do it at Quest, you can do it at LabCorp, you can do it with us. We're less expensive, okay? But what it tells you is how to adjust these um, interventions. So the estrogen patch, the estradiol patch, is one of the most expensive ways to deliver estradiol to a person. The typical dosage transdermally in my practice is about four milligrams a day, which is eight times what this lady is getting. The other thing is that progesterone, when given orally, hits the liver, it goes to the stomach, 80% of it's uh, absorbed in something called enterohepatic recirculation. It go, it's a big word, but it has a meaning. It goes to the liver and screws you up. So sex hormone binding globulin gets elevated and wouldn't you know it, your estrogen needs increase because your body is tying it up. So do I use progesterone orally? Only under protest. I've got a f maybe two patients that take it orally because they just don't like using the cream. So that's fine. We've got like 60,000 patients and I got two that'll use the, the, the progesterone orally. It's also the most expensive way to get it done. So oral progesterone costs between 80 and 120 bucks a month, but our creams for the estrogen and the progesterone typically cost our patients $28 per month for both of them. Now, are these creams that you get uh, cobbled together at our Sta sponsor? Uh, pharmacies? Yeah, the, the, uh, the pharmacy that I use almost exclusively is pharmacy specialist in Altamont Springs. Now, I used the a parent company, the original company of this one, almost 35 years ago. So I've been sending business to these guys and gals ever since. They are probably the finest uh, compounding pharmacists that I know. And I know lots of them. I used to make a, a good living lecturing to their organizations. Right there off te of Maitland, yeah, teaching Maitland. them about how to make the transdermals and how to set, things up, set these things up. So I've known them for many years. They do a, a spectacular job. Now, it's a mom and pop shop, so you got to understand that it's not part of a chain, big company, or anything else. And as such, sometimes they are technologically challenged in terms of getting prescriptions Support to them. Support your locals. Yes, they're awesome. excellent. They make my hormone replacement. They make that for the rest of my family who's taking it. Some people in this house. Some people in this room that are, are remaining silent <laughs> and have been forever. So what, what do I have to say about it? Were I, were I you, I would probably get blood work. I would be looking at minimum at estradiol level, a cortisol level, progesterone, testosterone. You need that progesterone, testosterone, and you're going to need a DHEA level because many of these things have to be looked at in order for you to develop a good hormone replacement therapy regimen. So what do I recommend? I would recommend a, a full evaluation. And you're going to say, what about the hair? That's usually a thyroid issue. If you have inadequate testosterone and or progesterone, you're going to have inadequate uh, thyroid secretion. No estrogen in your bloodstream, no TSH, no thyroid. Mm. So they all work together. It's like gears in a watch. I like it. I like it. You got another one of text up there too. Oh, okay. What tests are needed to find out why cholesterol is high? Okay. Now, again, it gets back to the Swiss watch model. They have gears in there. They have escapes, these little things that flip back and forth to make those gears work in a particular way. That's how they work when they're not electronic watches, that is. And so why does cholesterol go up? It usually goes up because there's a problem with the liver, believe it or not. And why does the liver go wonky? Because that's where the, the, uh, pardon me, the cholesterol is made. It's almost always a thyroid-related issue. Mm -hmm. So when you see an elevation in cholesterol, 20% of it is, is a dietary, and that's it, just 20%. So if you took out all the cholesterol from your diet, it wouldn't change more than 20%. It's very hard to take it all out of your diet. But there's almost always a, a thyroid issue causing it. So I start with the thyroid and work it from there. And you know, the joke here is, is that you can do, you can cause thyroid issue. You know, you can do it on your own, not having a, a structural or, or functional uh, thyroid issue. You can do it with your diet. You can do it with your diet. If you're sucking down a, a soy protein in the form of a shake or a bar or whatever it happens to be, it's gonna bump your cholesterol up. And this is the funny thing, okay, because back in the 70s, they told us not to eat eggs, not to eat cheese, not to eat milk, <laughs> because it would bump your, because you had to get rid of your cholesterol. 
right? So what did they do? They substituted soy and all this garbage. It's and horrible. wouldn't you know it, cholesterol went up, heart disease went up, and nobody did well with it. Bad idea. Hey, um, we got a couple of questions here I want to get in, but we were initially talking about insulin resistance. Yeah, let's want to roll back to that right, right. now and then I take this out. I do because we have uh, – well, we're out there on the social media. We broadcast. Oh, we better. Oh, yes. You can see Dr. Dave's beautiful mug. Uh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> on Stages of Life Medical Institute. Follow us on the social media, Facebook, you know, Twitter, YouTube as well. And uh, the question coming off of Facebook is, for insulin resistance, what is a good way to control it other than meds? Okay. Well, first, you know, I'm, I'm going to mention the meds first because it's not what you th think necessarily. The medication that I use most frequently to get things started is metformin, and the reason I do it is that many of the pharmacies – but Publix in particular gives it away for free. So all of a sudden the price is right, so attitudes about medicines can change very quickly. Your doctor does in fact have to write the prescription, but it's something that I take on a daily basis because it keeps my weight down. It's marvelous stuff. It keeps my blood sugar, my insulin down, and lowered my weight. So if, I, if somebody says, well, I don't want to take metformin, I don't want to take Glyburide, which is the other one that I use with it. Glimepamide. This was what the chemical's called. I will use something called vanadyl sulfate, which is a mineral. Van vanadyl sulfate. Uh, vanadium is a mineral. It's a transition element. And it was the first medication, prescription medication, that's now over the counter, which makes it not a medicine anymore, mind you. And it was called an insulin cut. Insulinomimetic. It's called an anti-diabetic. Okay. It was the first one ever introduced in the early uh, 20th century. So it is marvelous stuff, but it, you have to be careful with it. If you take too much of it, it can cause misery. So what's the dosage between 40 and 40 milligrams? You just have to go lightly with it. Best done with somebody that knows what they're talking about. Chromium polynicotinate. Sometimes they'll use chromium picolinate, but the polynicotinate's the better moiety. Those two things are very, very good to reduce insulin levels. So those are the two mainstays. Vanadium and chromium. What else do you take? You need to make sure you have enough magnesium, manganese. You need to make sure that you have an appropriate vitamin mix. Why? Because things like inositol, which is a, an obligate B vitamin, is necessary for the insulin receptor to work. So we use, insulin, we use a inositol to treat diabetes. We use berberine, which is an herb, to treat it. Very much the same way that uh, the metformin works. They work on something called AMPK, which is a, a, a adenosine monophosphate kinase, which is an enzyme system, which goes wonky in the insulin receptor. So these are the sorts of things that we do that are non-medicinal, but they are medicinal. Just because something by law is, needs, requires a prescription does not make it dangerous, and just because something's over the counter doesn't make it safe. You know, so for the longest time in my practice, I didn't put these things out where anybody could touch them. We had a store, but you couldn't touch anything. <laughs> Go figure, right? So then Step why? Away. Because I was afraid people would come in and buy stuff without my permission or my guidance, thereby doing damage. And I take Makes that sense. very seriously. Mm -hmm. So what do we do now? We put them out. <laughs> you know? But I'm there all the time. So it's kind of like, okay, if you need me, I'm right here. And the girls know when to call me when somebody looks like they're doing something goofy. You know, If they know what they're doing or their listeners or their patients, we don't mind it so much. But when folks come in saying, hey, what do you take for X, Y, and Z? They'll pull me out of a room because somebody is going to do damage. Mm. Speaking of doing damage, boy, we just killed that 10-minute segment. Just, there we go. Poof, I hope you all learned something. It'll never something. come back either. No, it's, it's, it's in the books, my friends. 407-916-5400. We had a lot of questions lined up on the text line already at 23680. And the social media is on fire right now. So we'll sort all through this. Figure out what floats to the top and get to your questions right after this commercial break. Support our sponsors, won't you? Like Pharmacy Specialists. We talked about them already. You can find them at MakeRx.com. This is Stages of Life Radio. So, uh, yeah, did you see some of the internet ones? Yeah, what I'm going to do, I'm, what, what, coming up, we're going to talk about... You know, about postmenopausal women and severe atherosclerosis, because okay. those are two very interesting problems that you see simultaneously, very, very frequently. And yeah, you do go Not after Elizabeth. them both. You go, right. you go after them both. And so that's one we're going to want to wait okay. until we go live. All right, so Elizabeth, we're going to give you some radio love with that one. Uh, Marie, she's oh, okay. right down the street. Yeah, let me get you, can you move your, your, your um, move I that to your... I don't want to hit your car. 
Oh. Yeah, yeah, there you <laughs> Yeah, well, she, it's okay. She's looking to figure out ways to hit my chair to make it drop. I know. Okay, so let's talk with uh, Marie. She's a 55-year-old female that lives in Lake Mary, where I used to live. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. So the doctor makes me get Synthroid brand rather than the generic to treat my hypothyroidism. So what you've got is two wrongs making, trying to make a right. She told me that the generic uh, for it does not work as well. Quite true. The Synthroid hard. doesn't work either. Mm-hmm. Just so you know, it's just more expensive. Uh, so what is the right way to do it? And it works a little something like this. Synthroid has been around for a long time. It's been around for about 50 years. And it is a very, very fine, pure T4. The body has to convert T4 to T3 before it works. So 16% of the population without autoimmune thyroid disease, 16% have inhibition for one reason or another of the ability to convert T4 to T3. So if you're hypothyroid and you're taking straight T4, it takes a whole bunch of assumptions to know whether or not it's going to work at all. So you can use Lavoxyl, which is, which is the, one of the generics, you, you know, it's, and, and that's just fine. A lot of people do, and they save the extra 35 or $40 or whatever the difference is between the brand name and the generic. What I use is a combination product, which is T4 and T3. The one I was using was called Nature Throid until they started having some production issues. Armor Thyroid's been around for, I guess, 100 years. Armor Thyroid has both T4 and T3. NP Thyroid has been around um, for a much shorter period Armor of time. Armor Thyroid is very expensive. Well, it's actually not very expensive. It's about a dollar a day, mm. okay, which is not that expensive. When you get right down to it, to, you know, there are people out there that will spend that on, let's say, a quarter of a cup of a latte. Oh, stop it. Well, then they're on their own. Yeah. So you know, it's about a dollar a day. So they don't give these things away, and that's the way it goes. When I had Nature Thyroid in my office, it was, I guess, 60 cents a day. Hey, so, oh, there we go. Yep, I think we just hit the eject button for somebody. I did. So what do I think about Synthroid? I don't like it. Okay, I don't like the generics. Any, I, in fact, I <laughs> dislike the generics even worse. I just want to let you know, that was George, our regular caller. Oh, that was, that, was, that was Marie. Oh, that was, oh, poor George. Okay. Sorry, George. He wants to know about acupuncture. Okay, I told then him we've, it, yeah. we've got a gal here who wants me to talk about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and supplements for that. That's actually a, a common problem. Ooh. All right, stay tuned, guys. We'll, uh, we'll hit the, uh, the radio here in just a second and try to get in as many of your questions as possible. Thank you, Linda. And thank you to the radio audience out there giving us all that applause. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome back to Stages of Life Radio. Please hold your applause down. The doctor is is in the house. Yeah, the orchestra's taking up most of the room. Yeah, you know where I'm from. We say orchestra. (laughs) Orchestra. (laughs) The orchestra was great tonight. All right, on violin, we got Dr. David Klein. (laughs) Ah, well. In person. I'm your bassist. Yeah, and I'm not dying of, of, of serious illness. Thank you know, goodness. I have not missed a day due to illness. Hey, you know, there's some questions, uh, speaking of which, uh, which <clears throat> about the uh, vaccine. Yeah, okay. The difference between the Moderna and the J. Well, the thing, what she wanted to know is the Pfizer and the J&J. Yeah. So the issue is, sure? okay, the Moderna and the Pfizer are both very similar. Both messenger RNA uh, vaccines. Okay. What does this mean? It's, it's a brilliant new kind of vaccine. It's a, it's a piece of, of RNA, which is similar to DNA, but it's, it's missing a particular molecule of oxygen. And it's surrounded by chicken soup, okay? It's a, a type of, it's a, there's a lipid in there, and they form these little micelles, these little globules. And the messenger RNA is protected from it as it's injected, but also it's just irritating enough to cause a cell type, you know, called a macrophage, to come in and eat it. When the macrophage eats the mRNA, the mRNA goes to the uh, production center of the mast cell, or pardon me, the uh, 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 macrocyte, macrophage, pardon me. And then it starts to produce these little, oh, they're like little moles, little bumps on the outside of that cell, causing the antibody reaction. Very, very effective, and it works, works beautifully. I, so when I got, I'd highly recommend it. Tess, my wife, got the Pfizer. She's just fine with it. We both developed um, very high levels of the antibody. The J&J is a little bit different. It uses a, a different type of viral vector to get the stuff into the cell. Very different indeed. It doesn't cause the same level of immune response. Mm. So what's the advantage to it? The advantage is that you only have to get one shot. That's helpful if you're coming across the border as an illegal, okay, and they want to hit you with something so that well, you you're might. you're never going to go You're back. never yeah, going back. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're going to disappear into the heartland of this country, infecting everybody you come in contact with, or at least 10% of them will. So what they'll do is it's very helpful there. 
it's very helpful for other sorts of transient populations or if you're in a, in a hospital situation, you want to get them back to the nursing home, you hit them with the inoculation and you don't really care so much at that point that only 60% of them will develop the antibodies, whereas 96 to 98% will do it with the, uh, the double inoculation approach. My money goes in the double inoculation. Really? And from seeing what's coming out of it in terms of the antibody response, it seems to be dramatic. So I have patients that got uh, COVID. I got COVID. My wife got COVID. So it wasn't near as just so you know, it wasn't as much fun as they say that it is. We no both got sicker fun. than stink. Okay. But I checked. I had an opportunity, really, to check my own antibodies level. That was Why? Cool. Because I have my own lab. It's marvelous. I'd, I'd call my staff up. I'd say, okay, Doctor. you know, I'm coming in. So that way they could clear everybody out. <laughs> and we would do <laughs> antibody studies for myself and my wife. So I got the inoculation the day that I got. The, actually, it's in the third day uh, of the infection. Didn't know that I had it. Okay, it's just the way it goes. And so I went and got the shot. That night I was told that I had COVID. Whoops. Yeah, I hate that. And so I was able to track my antibodies and my wife simultaneously over the next eight weeks. So we did it weekly, plus or minus, and found that the inoculation speeded up the recovery period. In her, in her case, it, the fact that she didn't get the shot, she was 10 days slower. But also she was 10 days slower in developing the antibody response. So getting the shot makes a huge, huge difference. How much antibody do you get when you get the shot? It's about 10 times, 10 to 20 times than if you got the disease itself. So my antibodies shot up. Hers did not move, even though she had active disease. So what do I think? I think you get the shot. Which one? I would recommend the Pfizer. Why? Because you can do it on a three-week cycle rather than a four-week cycle. But just as it is on the Titanic, as the boat's going down, the ship is sinking. <laughs> Don't argue over which lifeboat you want to go in because that's not your lucky number. You get in whatever's available. So if you show up and they say, well, guess what? You're going to get X, Y, and Z. You know what you do? You say, yes, sir, no, sir, thank you very much, and roll up your sleeve and go. So this is a matter of um, patriotism. This is not just a matter of, gee, you know, you're going to be told what to do. This is necessary for the country to get back oh, to work. Bummer. I feel let down. I'm signed up for the Moderna one. That's oh, good. That's fine. I got the Moderna one. It's, okay. it's just perfectly fine. We do have a question we need to pose here. Uh, pose the question. From Elizabeth on our website. Uh, what do we Our webpage here. Uh, for postmenopausal women with severe arthrosclerosis. Atherosclerosis. Or atherosclerosis. Can they use the hormone creams? And uh, hormones are at zero. She says she's also got hair loss. Yeah. Well, she's going to have hair loss. Her, her uh, gonadotropins, the estrogen, progesterone, testosterone are zeroed out, which is the direction they go in as you get older. Mm -hmm. What's older? 50 years old. 55 years old is, is kind of uh, where we typically see folks, but certainly it gets worse if it could get worse as you get older. So the atherosclerosis comes from the lack of testosterone as well as the inflammation that you're seeing from the thyroid not working properly. So you go ahead, you restore a level of estradiol between 50 and 80 is where your goal is going to be. Testosterone, again, easily remember, 50 to 80. The progesterone, between 1 and 2. If you can do that, then all of a sudden the thyroid starts to work more properly. The likelihood is you're going to need a little bit of thyroid also because as you get older, thyroid function diminishes. So when you do bioidentical hormone replacement, it's just not gonadotropins, but it may be adrenal, it may be a parathormone, it may be a lot of different things, but you don't want to limit your thought process because of the definition of HRT or hormone replacement therapy in certain areas. So what we do in my office is we look at the whole shooting match. We look at the thyroid, we look at the, the gonads, we look at the pituitary, we look at the pancreas. If you have insulin uh, that's too high, these things don't work, which is fascinating. Parathyroid can go wonky. Lots of things can happen to make you sick. So what we do is we go in and do a very extensive workup. Okay. And then we start uh, treating everything at one time. Why waste time? All right, let's go back to the text line here at 23680. You're listening to Stage Life Radio, Sunday 4 to 5, live on News Radio WFLA Orlando. How much do you charge for a consultation, blood work, and follow up? Well, it depends. Okay, so if, if you're Medicare, the blood work comes for free, okay, because Medicare covers it all. If you're with Cigna, United, or Blue Cross, we typically send you out or We'll give you the option of doing it in, in the office, which is faster and probably a lot better, but it could be as little as 200 bucks to as much as 490. 
if you go out to the main, uh, the, you know, the big commercial labs, it's eight times that amount. So if your insurance doesn't cover it or if they don't like the diagnosis codes, you could have a bill up to 3800 bucks. And I've seen this happen. It happened to me um, almost, what, 20 years ago. Mm. I ended up with a bill for 1800 bucks because somebody miscoded the doctor who did the referral for me. Oh, so I had to write that check. So it would have been a whole lot cheaper if I'd paid cash in my own office than having gone out. So, you know, that's pretty much what it is. New patient evaluation, it depends on the individual. It could be as little as 200 If, if it's, again, whatever your insurance copay happens to be is what it typically costs uh, for the a consultation. If we don't do your health insurance, then it could be as little as two hundred. Could be as much as four seventy or four eighty. So it's uh, and it takes about three to four hours. So okay. it's there. You're not in and out like a a, a minute, oh, no, minute this, clinic. You, yeah, you this know, is this is an all afternoon get affair. Get dropped off, send to whoever's driving you for lunch. Yeah, <laughs> maybe yeah, a it library. Is, it is not a quick deal. We do no. not do no, a sloppy or halfway job. Right there. Hey, we got another question here. Uh, did Doc? I, I suffer from throat globus. Is that right? I'm not really sure what the but, food sensitivity testing at the office. Do you do that? Might no. be environmental. Yeah, okay. I think what she's looking at there is just basically phlegm production. Well, okay. you haven't told me about that. I get real phlegmy with certain things that I eat. Well, we, but something we, like that. in the radio business, what are the two things you don't eat before you go on the air? Well, uh, Dairy and peanut butter. Yeah, yeah. You don't eat those things because they tend to cause the production well, of mucus. Crocker, now, cracker. Now, ask your family doctor, why does it do that? And the answer is going to be, well, I don't really know. And the answer, the answer is, is you are what you eat. Okay, and food has interesting influences on how you feel. Mm. So you can take somebody with arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. You, they can have just regular osteoarthritis, and you go ahead and give them a an ice cream meal. You go ahead and give them a scoop, a bowl of ice cream, and it'll make their arthritis worse. You take somebody that has thyroid disease, and you give them spaghetti and meatballs with lots and lots of Parmesan cheese, and it makes it worse because food. Be thy medicine. Okay, it goes back to Hippocrates. So what can cause you to, to kick out um, phlegm from your throat? Uh. Can it be allergic or can it be dietary? And the answer is yes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Most of the time it's dietary with Most me. Most of the time it's like, dietary. There, Elizabeth. Uh, yeah, milk products, it, cheese products. Right. And, but it doesn't mean allergy. No. So you can do food allergy testing and be misled by this. Yep. So what is the difference between a food sensitivity and a food allergy? And the answer is something called immunoglobulin class E or IgG, IgE for short. So if you have an allergic issue with foods, you'll pick it up that way. Sometimes you'll pick it with IgM in the bloodstream. But sensitivity and allergy are two different things. Food allergies themselves are actually fairly unusual. But food sensitivities are very common. Why does this happen? Well, let's just say that you have a food sensitivity to uh, to dairy. Because you have gallstones. Guess what? what? Okay, that doesn't mean that you have a blood-borne illness. It means you have gallstones. Oh. You know, that's just the way it works. Okay, we've Lots got a of couple more questions to answer and another segment to do so. 407-422-1212. You can follow us on Facebook at Stages of Life Medical Institute. The same handle for YouTube. And also text us, yeah. 23680. And if you go to stagesoflifemedicalinstitute.com, you can see all of our websites. And there, there are go. many, yeah. many things to look at. Let's really land there and take off four points. <laughs> there Known. you go. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll be right back. <laughs> might only be like a minute break all right yeah so i was scheduling something you have a yeah it doesn't look like it's gonna take you have a question online here about supplements for nafld non-alcoholic fatty liver disease yes all right no no problem that's actually that's okay non-alcoholic fatty liver disease what does this mean i mean somebody found either fibrosis or fatty deposits within the liver in somebody who's a non-alcoholic so it's a disease that isn't really a disease. That's it's a finding. So something, something is wrong with your liver, and it's not alcoholism. Okay, that kind of narrows it down to about a hundred different things, doesn't it? A hundred easily. So could it be hepatitis C? The answer is yes. Could it be hepatitis A or B? And the answer is well, maybe. Could it be hepatitis D, E, F, G, or H? The answer is of course. What else can cause the the liver to go wonky? So. There are um, inborn errors in the metabolism that can do it. You can see it, again, with insulin resistance syndrome. You can see it with hypothyroidism, and you can see it with gallbladder disease. You can see it with certain infectious diseases. So we're going to go over that in just a second with this youngster. And here we go. 
I, uh, well, close as I can do. All right, did you get an old cover? We need more on that one. Well, I think, you know, I think I, I have, the only thing I didn't discuss was what do you do about it? Thanks, Melanie. Did you get that? <laughs> no, well, she didn't because because I didn't tell her how to, what she needs to take. Okay, she's gonna. He's coming. It's coming. Yeah, don't worry. Hang on. Easy, now. easy Hang action. <laughs> Welcome back to Stages of Life Medical Institute's show called Stages of Life Radio. It's pretty crazy how we do that. Isn't yeah, it? Look, just, it's a coincidence because that's also the name of my business. Oh, look at that! That's Dr. David Klein. That's K L E I N. Yeah. Check him out. Yeah, he's got five board certifications, and the guy never stops I'm not done learning. Yet. He's, I was going to say, he's still not <laughs> done. I'm still working on Okay, it. so we were answering a question off of the internet, off our uh, Facebook page at Stages of Life Medical Institute, and Melanie checked it. She wanted to know supplements that you can use to treat non-alcoholic fatty liver, fatty disease. liver disease. So N- NAFLD okay, is the acronym that's used, and it's generally given to somebody as almost like an Academy Award for having something going on in their liver that you pick up an ultrasound, mm. most typically. But when asked, how much do you drink? And if you go, I don't drink, then they go, oh, then you just just have NAFLD, which means that you have something wrong with your liver, and we just don't know what it is. But we know it's not alcohol. No, it's not alcohol. <laughs> so the first few things you want to do is to make sure that the workup is, is a little bit more complete than that. Uh-huh. So have them check you thoroughly for hepatitis. Okay, not just hepatitis A and B, but also C. You want to get them all. So you look at the at the liver enzymes. So if the liver enzymes are just like moderately or modestly elevated, something is happening. More times than not, it's either going to be thyroid or it will be gallbladder disease. So typically what I do is I pull people off of soy products because if it's thyroid, that straightens it out. It takes about 6 to 12 weeks before you'll see it on ultrasound. But in terms of the nutraceuticals, I use two things. And the joke is they both used to be prescription that were then turned into over-the-counter oh, products. Gee. So if this makes them if this makes them non-medicinal, I'd still amused by that. First one's called N-acetylcysteine, sometimes known as NAC. You take five to six hundred milligrams three to four times per day. That might be breakfast, lunch, dinner, bedtime, or it might be you know just as, as you can take it. Mm-hmm. It smells a little bit like rotten eggs. It is not rotten eggs, but it will it will thin the biliary secretions making the gallbladder drain and thereby making the liver drain a little bit better. It takes the pressure off the hepatocytes and wouldn't you know it, sometimes the fatty disease goes away. But it doesn't work by itself necessarily. So you add another medication called guaifenesin. Guaifenesin was developed initially as a muscle relaxant. It became known as a mucolytic and you will know this by the brand name Mucinex. So I'm too cheap to buy the brand name, so I buy the generic and it works just fine. It is the original blue pill, blue round pill in this case, (laughs) and you take one with each of the NAC. What does it do? It makes sure that the liver drains, thereby taking the, uh, the pressure, metabolic pressure off the liver. In the meantime, what else does it do? It drains the pancreas. It also drains your prostate if you have one. It drains your, your sinuses. It drains a lot of different glandular tissue because it thins secretions across the board. It doesn't have a, a direction uh, finder on it for the um, liver. It hits everything. Marvelous stuff. You find yourself coughing, sneezing, and bringing up secretions from your lungs. So NAC, again, Mucinex, the, the, uh, the NAC itself is actually used to treat things like cystic fibrosis as well as other respiratory illnesses. It works beautifully for this. So what else have we got there, my friend? Well, I, I, I see someone answering someone's question on, okay, that's, on I, hey, this the is, internet. Okay, this is fine. Good. And I want to make sure that, uh, well, you know, and no offense to anybody if it works for you. Now, uh, initially, in an earlier segment, Linda on our Facebook live feed had asked how to uh, to take care of the insulin resistance without medication. Sure. Now, Luann is saying that she used keto, uh, dropped her AC1, and she's off the meds now for three years and does uh, echo the diet is oh, that's key fine. to everything. The diet is key to everything. Mm-hmm. You know, but, you know, uh, and coming off the medications, marvelous. Right. It all works very well. Good but for you. Uh, unless you know your insulin level and check your insulin level, mm-hmm. you don't know how well you're doing. Right. And so, then she said it was keto as well as intermittent fasting. Well, the intermittent fasting, you know, the intermittent fasting is something that we all do anyway. Right. It's when we go to bed. We go to bed. We have an eight to 10 hour fast. There are people that do uh, religious fasting. You know, we have mm-hmm. all kinds of, sure. of, this has been going on for thousands of years. But the idea of putting your body into ketosis. Ketosis and- just simply means that you're not taking in enough 
um, caloric you know, load in order to keep yourself from losing weight. So every diet that gives you less calories than, than you have to, to uh, live is going to make you ketotic. So ketosis is not a lifestyle. It is not a type of uh, diet. It's just simply what happens when you do diet. So as you start to burn fat, ketones are, are uh, generated. In fact, if you go out of control with your diabetes, you become ketotic. It doesn't necessarily mean healthy. It's just a physical finding. So, yeah, you want to check your numbers, Luann, and make yeah. sure that you are actually at the level yeah. that so you need to the be. Key, the, key, uh, the key to the keto diet, the key to the keto diet is coming off carbohydrates. Right. Which, by the way, is something that the American Diabetes Association has been recommending for 60 years. Well, carbs is bad. Bad for you. <laughs> so, yeah, so you did yeah. it. Congratulations. More as what they used to say, more power to you. More power to you. Yeah, that's yeah. that. I thought it used to be the the Duke Powers logo. Oh right. Well, they stole that from something else. Yeah. I'm sure. But uh, anyway, so there you go with regards to keto or intermittent fasting. Sure, they're all ways of bringing your insulin uh, resistance and all and dealing with pre-diabetes. Yeah. Diet is everything. That is a very good statement. I prefer there. the South Beach diet. Yeah, um, which is what? The, no uh, carbs. No carbs. Now, see, I'm more of a Mediterranean kind that's, of that's diet. Fine. I like my oils and such, and, yeah. and I well, definitely the, like the my thing vegetables. With keep, yeah, the thing with South Beach, you do that too. Yeah. All I know is all ma basically it's all the same thing. The same. the one thing you stay away from is processed foods and anything and everything the in center, moderation. The center of the grocery store. It's so, horrible. Bad. Bad news. <laughs> so what do I do? Personally, I'll eat a whole grapefruit every day, mm -hmm. if not two. That thing is peeled and the, the whole thing is eaten. What if, because it actually takes more calories but, to consume but, a grapefruit. But what, than if it, what if it fights with your medicines? I can't take it. Well, it, what does it do? What does it do for what, your medication? What's the medication acidic thing? Is that what it is? No, what it does is it actually makes you a, a cheaper drunk. So <laughs> it, the blood oh, levels so of the, the blood levels of the statins go up. So you just have to moder moderate that a little bit. Wait a minute, drinking what? No. So what it what it does? It dislodges the medications from um, the proteins in your blood. So that's so, not good. No, it's not bad. You just have to know that it does it. So if you're if you're on oh. Coumadin, it's a problem. If you're on Digitalis, it's a problem. If you're taking a high dose of a statin, it's a problem. But if you're taking low doses, it doesn't make any yeah. difference at all. I think next show we do myth busting. We could do that. Yeah, that would be fun. Yeah, or can I diet bring, busting. Can I bring in some of the stuff like they do on TV? You know, what was that blow one it up? we did? That, you're right. No, not in my studio. Uh, liver and, uh, what was it? The liver and, liver and grapefruit diet back in the day? Oh, th my favorite one was the Stillman diet. Oh, wait. Okay. okay which is grapefruit and as much meat as you want to eat. And you would lose weight. For a moment. Each until you one, die. Until you die. <laughs> Each one of these diets, people lose weight. Sure. At initially, because of the changes. Yeah, right? I mean, well, I'm going to put a stick of butter in my coffee and I'll lose weight. That's yeah, a keto it's, it's, thing. Don't do it. Oh, it's, horrible. it's awful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> eventually, eventually, the diet that you're going to develop is called atherosclerosis and heart attack. Mm -hmm. So, no, it doesn't work so well unless you no. don't like the person who's doing it, in which case you encourage them. Butter. Yum. More butter. Here, 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 have some, have some more butter. I'll, I'll, I'll buy it for you. Oilio, oleo. Mm. <laughs> yeah, oleo margarine. Mm. Okay, it's another poison. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what do you want to do? The real doctor butter. suggests that you eat real butter, lightly real salted. milk, real cream, and go lightly on it, and you'll mm -hmm. do fine. Again, didn't I say that everything in in moderation? Moderation. That's that's the words that I have lived by all of my life when it comes to strange foods or or overeating or overindulging in anything. Everything in moderation. Yeah. Okay. You know, there's no need to, to open up a can of peanuts so, and eat the whole can. Yeah. So, <laughs> you, know, you know, my best friend, my best buddy, oldest friend, mm -hmm. okay, just lost 20 pounds over the past three weeks because oh. he came in the office. We did his blood work. I blessed him out and told him that he was consuming too many carbs. Blessed him out. That's and how that we he call was, it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so I said, you know, I said, listen, I've known you for for better part of uh, 40 years, a little hmm. bit, you know, 45 years. You know, I'd really rather you stay around a little bit longer. So how about let's bring your triglycerides down, your insulin down, your blood sugar down by not consuming any carbs at all. Three weeks later, he's lost 20 pounds. So we went riding, motorcycle riding for, for a bike week. Mm. And he looked good. For, yeah, I mean, honestly, it was, it was pretty impressive. Good on you, dude. Yeah. There you go. See, that's testimony you cannot beat. Stagesoflifemedicalinstitute.com. You'll find all the different websites we've referenced and all the information about becoming a new patient, vitamins, nutru, uh, uh, nutraceuticals. nutraceuticals. That's the word. Thank you, Doc. Anyway, check them out. Stagesoflifemedicalinstitute.com. Say goodbye, Doc. Goodbye, and I'm looking forward to meeting you. <laughs> <laughs> See you tomorrow. 
You've been listening to Stages of Life Radio with Dr. David Klein. Check out stagesoflifemedicalinstitute.com or stop by 1917 Booth Circle in Longwood near the intersection of I-4 and 434. Call 407-679-3337. That's 407-679-3337. Dr. Klein accepts most insurance and Medicare too. 